Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Session Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the Session 1 Reminders and Homework Review presentation, Jesus works through reminders from the previous Analyze My Desire to Love and Change session and reviews the homework of the participants. Recorded on the 23rd of February 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Bright and bushy tailed this morning, as the saying goes. Are we? No? A few sunburned faces today. <laughs> Must have been out in the, down the beach or something in the sun yesterday. Okay. Well, I've, cha I've changed around the program a little bit today and tomorrow. Um, just a, the sequence of the presentations are a little different than what you might expect. So, but this morning we're still going to do a bit of a revision first, and then we'll do go through some of your homework, and uh, and then we'll get started after a break. We'll get started on the program for this particular two sessions. So this, these sessions are now focused on, these two sessions after our review, will be, sp will be focused on analy uh, sort of working through how, how do we work through the fears associated with you know, a number of different things with regard to our will and how these particular fears influence our will. Remember last, uh, the last session was really about analysing whether we do really have a will to love and change. So, so we spend a lot of time trying to be a bit more analytical about our emotions, but, uh, but it's more important to feel them than, anal than to analyse them, isn't it? But you can see also from our discussion last time that it's also quite tricky sometimes because we have a lot of self-delusion type of things going on and we, we, want, um, we, want our, we want ourselves to be able to support the soul-based condition, our current soul-based condition. And so what we do is we create a whole heap of imaginary belief systems and imaginary, even imaginary emotions to support those particular belief systems so that we don't have to feel the real emotions. So that, that is a big problem with the, when we exercise our will. We're exercising our will in that circumstance to actually try hard to avoid the process of growth. Right, and this is a, one of our major problems, and that's why, why developing our will is the very first thing we wanted to focus your attention on. All right, so these were the basic things we discussed, weren't they? You remember them? Yeah. Yep. So what did we learn about the first, the first thing, the first presentation, which was the very first presentation on the morning of the first day, the Saturday morning? What did we learn about that? So Ange, right up the back. That we need to go to the higher source. Yes, and what, what does that mean to go to the higher source? What, what does it mean? Uh, that we need to go to God. Need to go to God, but so what does that mean? Relationship with God. <laughs> but what does that mean? Um, <laughs> to receive God's truth, God's definition of truth. So it's, a, it's, it's allowing God's definition of truth to enter ourselves, isn't it? That's the trick. Yes. That's the, yes. That's the most important thing. So, so we can use all this terminology, but at the end of the day... If we don't allow God's truth to enter us, pretty, mu pretty much there's no education from a higher source. And you contrast that to the source of the world's education, and it's no wonder we're in a mess because we're all trying to get education from each other and none of us really know what we're doing. Right? So, so that's why it's important to get education from the highest source. All right, and in, in that uh, presentation we also learnt one other thing. What was that about, Joy? Uh, Yvonne? Over corner, sorry. Um, we learned that um, one of the reasons it's important is because God's definition is of love is so different to the world's definition of love. Yes. What yeah. proof do we have of that? Oh, heaps. Like the problem that humanity's in, it's all been um, showing up our unlovingness yes in yep. terms of all the pain and suffering that's on the planet yes so That's there so there we see a need to measure 
mm. humanity's ac actions over thousands of years and ask ourselves, well, if we, if we want to keep doing what we've been doing for thousands of years, then of course we're going to get the same result we've gotten for the last thousand, for thousands of years. And we haven't really tried God's way. No, no, that's the big all. problem, isn't it? <coughs> we haven't tried God's way. Most of us want to avoid trying God's way, so, so that is a big problem. Yeah. Glenn? Just a little add on to that, which you mentioned in the middle was that while we have the um, the wrong truth or our own truth inside us, that yep. God's truth can't enter. Exactly. So we've got to somehow get rid of what we believe to be true, which is actually false most of the time. We've got to get rid of that. And, and where, where do those truths come from inside of us? They're all based on some kind of emotional position, aren't they? Right? It's not just an intellectual process, as you've learned. Many of you have tried the intellectual process now for quite a few years, right? Trying to use that willpower to change your mind and everything. But as soon as you're put in a situation, what happens? Back to the same behaviour as before. And that's why it has to be a real change that occurs. And, uh, and the real change is only possible by allowing God's truth in. But, but to allow God's truth in, we've got to let what we think is true which is actually false out and and that's the challenge the challenge is letting that out because it's painful to let it out and most of us want to avoid pain okay so then we focused on this other question how i feel about love and there we wanted to focus your attention primarily on how you feel about God and God's love. Because obviously it's God's love that's going to transform you. So how do you feel about it? And what did we learn in that uh, section? Can you remember? So if we come down to Rachel and then down to Lani. Um, so much of what we feel about God's love is actually related to our parents. Yes. And our relationship with them. So we have all of this sort of really negative feelings about God and really negative feelings about God's love. And in fact, many of you might remember the very first time I started talking about God with you, you many of you would have had already just a reaction to the word God, let alone the, because of all of the negative connotations that word tends to bring up. And this is the big problem is that, is that None of us have had a relationship with God. None of us have been treated badly by God. In fact, in, in a lot of ways, we've been treated very well by God already in the sense that we've been given will, we've been given life, we've been given all of the things necessary to sustain life and so forth. And, and yet we don't see that as God's gift to humanity. We, we, we instead see, see all of the negatives, but those negatives actually have nothing to do with our personal relationship with God because we haven't had one. So we don't know. And this is the lack of logic that we have as humankind. We, we, we apply things to situations which we've had no prior knowledge or experience with rather than deal with the situations that we have had prior knowledge and experience with that have been negative, that have caused us to, co to, to hold on to a whole group of quite you know, destructive emotions. And we'd rather do that. And this is a big problem. Many of you are still in that fa cycle where you'd rather do that. Rather, rather do that than face the truth about your life. It's a lot easier to face the truth about your life. But in amongst there, remember too, we also focused on how we have the same attitude to God's God, God's love, God's laws, God's <laughs> anything that was applied in our family of origin. Oh, and, and while we're growing up, tends to get then focused on God. And we want to do that. And the reason why we want to do that is that it gets us away from having to address where the real problem started. Right? Because most of the time we're trying to maintain a relationship with where the real problem started. With our parents or our family of origin or whoever brought us up, we're trying to still get those things that we never got from them. And so we can't, we, we feel we can't confront that relationship. And so what do we do? We, we put all the burden of that relationship on God and then we hope to start this one, this, this earth-based relationship in some kind of free 
and uh, you know clean state, um, <laughs> hoping that this person and or these group of people who who never gave us what we feel we wanted in the first place now might have the capacity to do so, and it's so logical, it's, <laughs> right? Because it's highly unlikely they'll have the capacity to do so until they change and they grow and they want to become more loving. It's highly unlikely they will be able to give you the things that you need or want. All right. And then on top of that, we've set up a whole heap of addictions with those particular people. And because they, those particular people don't satisfy those particular addictions very well, we then engage other relationships which will satisfy what we missed out from those particular people. All right. And those other relationships are basically what I would classify as a barter system. And a barter system is not love. Right. Remember, we need to get back to this concept that love is a gift and there's nothing you can do to earn it. Nothing. Not a single thing you can do to earn it. Yep. Okay, and then we focused on this aspect of how I feel about change. What did we learn about that? That particular aspect. Catherine, thanks. Just leave your hand up, Catherine, so, so he can see you. Well, <clears throat> we are frightened of change and we don't want change and things like that, whereas God is changing all the time. Yes. So if we don't change, we've got a problem. Yes, we've got a actually we've got a scientifically universal problem actually if we refuse to change. There, there's a whole lot of discussion in the sixth sphere of the spirit world. Uh, because because many of those six fear spirits have been in the same place for many thousands of years now and they realizing that they're not changing and then what they do is they analyze the universe itself and they see the universe is constantly changing so they see a general principle of truth is that constant change is necessary to exist in the universe and yet they're not changing and so some of them now have become they've set up schools trying to work out why it, why this uh, this problem exists where they are not changing but the but the universe is changing and what's and they're, they're, they're to a degree concerned about what may happen to them in the long run does that make sense because they can see this universal principle scientific principle of change occurring throughout the transformation of matter occurring throughout the universe and yet their particular selves themselves are not changing but they realize they had changed to get to that point but, but they can't change beyond that point. And so they're, they're very, very concerned. Not quite concerned enough <laughs> to uh, look at the simple, the simple truth about God's love and, and, and receiving truth from a higher source, you see. That, that requires more humility than even the average person here on earth is capable of, of, of feeling. And this requires the development of that quality. And you'll actually see in today's program and tomorrow that we'll be focusing your attention on this quality of humility, humility in each case because the quality of humility is an essential part of developing your will to change and, and being open to receiving, receiving from a higher source. You firstly got to recognise a higher source before you can receive anything from them. Does that make sense? And if you do not believe that there is any higher source other than yourself, then of course that's not going to be possible. Yeah. Rob, thanks. Um, just overnight I've realised that um, my concept of God is um, pretty much intellectual. Yep. I've just got a tiny seed of faith. There. I'm wondering if the spirits are in the same boat. Are they, is their concept intellectual? And yes. Yeah. Yes. So have, it hasn't gone into their soul yet. That's right. Many yeah. six fear spirits have uh, either an intellectual concept of God or no concept of God at all, actually. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And you can actually be in the six fear of the spirit world and not believe in God. So, so some of them are either atheists, still not believing in God and still believing themselves to be the highest manifestation of intelligence in the universe. Okay, thanks. Mm. It requires dealing with some emotions to get to have this emotional relationship with God and to actually start feeling God. When you start feeling God, then of course you know for certain that God exists. Yep. 
So this, you can see with all of our fears associated with change, and we're going to focus in the next couple of days on these fears, but you can see how the fears associated with change definitely affect or an impact upon how you use your will, don't they? Right, so, so if you're afraid of something, it's highly unlikely you will go to do it. That's our problem. What we try to do is we're afraid of something is we try to avoid it where possible. Right, so, so this is a big problem also. And again, we're tr trying to focus here on analysing ourselves and allowing ourselves to feel whatever emotions we feel to recognise that they're actually there. These particular things are there within us. Because if we don't see that there within us, we can't do anything about changing them, can we? Like a start to humility is to exa actually examine the truth of what's within. And then the next uh, morning we looked at how and why we remain unloving. Can you remember what our main discussions there were about? So if we come down to Denise and then maybe um, and to Deidre on this side. I remain unloving because I want to. I want to blame and justify everybody else instead of looking at myself. Yeah, so when we say we want to, let's be again a bit more specific now about that. What does that mean that we want to? Does um, it mean we intellectually want to? Because most of you don't, wouldn't feel you intellectually want to. Um, is it a will-based desire to remain unloving and not having a look at uh, being personally responsible for everything that if I actually looked at yeah. It, with God, I would know in myself that it was unloving and yes. want to stop it. Yes. So, so this is more. This is a big difference between the intellectual state of thinking you want something, and the emotional state of feeling you want something. Like, there's a big difference between that state, isn't it? It's like it's like if you were not hungry, it's very rare that you can manufacture an intellectual state where you eat. Have you noticed that? If you're not hungry, it's rare. Like if you're full, like you've just had a huge meal, right? You've had, you'd have had three courses, dessert, you know, finished it off with a cuppa of some kind, and you're just sitting there and you're all bloated and everybody, everything. And somebody says, look, I've got a lovely pizza to give you. Like, what would you, what would you do? You'd go, oh. <laughs> right, you can't manufacture the state of eating. You follow? If you've been satisfied. Right now, that that comes from within, doesn't it? That comes from the hunger triggering some brain chemicals that tell you that you need you need sustenance and so forth, and then that drives the desire to eat. Right now, it's very very similar with the desire to address anything emotionally or even to become loving. It has to come from. It can't be intellectually manufactured. It's got to come from another emotional source within us. Right. Remember, right in the first day, I gave the example of um, my life in the first century where I could not bear not knowing the truth. Yeah. Right. Now, uh, what I've seen is that many of you think you're in that state, but actually, a lot of the times I see y you have moments of that state, right? Where, where you might have, you know, half an hour feeling of like that. And then, and then what happens is you become disillusioned with, the, with ever being able to get out of that state, so you turn off any emotional response to that state. Right? Whereas I can't do that. I, I can't, so if I, I've got to know, like, <laughs> and there's nothing, like, it doesn't matter what happens, I've, I've just got to know. And what, what I would like to encourage you to do is to do the same, or get to that same state, where you've just got to know, you've just got to resolve it, you've just got to become more loving no matter what, no matter what pressure you're under, no matter what external influences that are there and so forth. All right. Now, this was uh, all about analysis, but, but we're trying to encourage you to more feel your feelings than intellectually analyse, I must have this particular problem, or I must have that particular problem. Feel what you feel. Right, about these particular problems. So, so when Rob just said earlier, you know, you realise that he's had just an intellectual concept of God. That's where, you know, that's an that's an acknowledgement of a truth of how he feels. It's no, it's not there yet. The feeling isn't there yet, and and so that that's a great start to see that the feelings are not there yet. 
and then to realize, work out, well, how do I develop, you know, how do I, you know, develop love for somebody? I, I've got to somehow do some things, take some actions that will actually help me develop this love, right? Because if I don't, then obviously I'll stay in that state where I don't have any real heart-based feeling for God and, and I haven't received God's love as a result. So, so this is what we need to do. is If we want to get an education in love, our will has to be engaged to truly examine our current state and to be really honest about where we're at. Right? Now, one of the questions that we asked also was, how are you going comparing where you're at, like a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, and things like that? Because that's one way to tell you where you're at. If things haven't really changed very much, then I would suggest the desire isn't very strong. Anything where the desire is strong, you change it pretty much immediately. Right? So if your desire, if, if nothing's changed in certain aspects of your life over the last five years, then it's highly unlikely you really have a very strong desire to change those particular things. And remember, desire is your will. It's your using your will. So this part of developing your will, very, very important. Very important. And the other thing we emphasised was this self-responsibility, that it's my will. I cannot place the burden of developing my will on you. You cannot place the burden of developing your will on somebody else. And because it belongs to you, not even God will develop your will for you. It's a gift that you've been given and it's your responsibility to do what you want with it. So if, you, if, if it's got to be developed in a certain direction, you're the one who, who will need to do that, choose to do that yourself. No one else can... Others can influence you by their suggestions and by their example and by you know, the things that they do in their life that you would like to do and things like that. They can influence you, but they can't make you. And many of you would like somebody to make you. Right. How many of you uh, did some kind of uh, university or, or higher education after school? Right? So the majority. Um, how many of you found yourself like when you had an exam, that's when you did the work? <laughs> the majority. That, that's an indication that you only do things when you put under pressure. When somebody's forcing you or threatening you with an outcome that you don't want. Right? Now, God doesn't do that. So that's our problem, right? We're, we're, we're there thinking, oh, I want someone to be like a slave driver, just keep me going, right? And, and, and God's not going to do that. God's not going to be like a university professor giving you exams and giving you this and you know, doing all of these things to keep you under, in line and under pressure so that you get an outcome that you think you want at the end. No, what, what God does is God says, right, if you really have a desire, I won't need to examine you. I won't need to pressure you. I won't need to control you. I won't need to threaten you. I won't need to do any of those negative things towards you because your will will determine how rapidly you progress. You see? Right? And so most of us, without that influence of, or threat, we go, okay, if God's not going to threaten us, then maybe I should threaten myself just to get myself motivated. And many of you have tried that, right? And does that work very well? No. no. And then you go, okay, um, well, what, what if we were in a partnership and then I'll, I'll threaten my partner and my partner will threaten me and then maybe we'll get somewhere. And, and does that work? No, usually it ends up in fights and arguments and, and even breakups and so forth. That can end up in quite easily. So can you see that unless it comes from within yourself, it really isn't going to happen, is it? No, not really going to happen. And we need to get honest about that. We need to get honest about that. There's no, there should be no need for any other person 
to be your cheer squad, to motivate you, to threaten you, to push you, to, to inspire you or any other thing in order to help you do what is right. It needs to come from within you, right? That's your will. That's your will. And can, so can you see how it's, it, many of us might think we have, have, have a strong will, but actually we've just got a stubborn streak <laughs> many times. And a strong will to do something positive um, is, is something that we need to learn how to develop. We need to develop that. Yeah. And that's going to take some effort on our part, isn't it? It's, re it's really, nobody else can do, do it for us. So we, we're the person who needs to decide to do that. So, so how many of you found yesterday you, you had the homework, right? And, and what happened with the homework? Did you find, oh, this morning, oh, we've got some homework. <laughs> so I better do that. How many of you tried that out? No? A few of you? Okay. And then yesterday, what happened? You thought, oh, I'll get some, get some entertainment first. So how many of you felt, felt like that? Some entertainment first. Then I'll go and do the homework. Yep, no worries. How many of you just did the homework because you really wanted to do the homework? All right. Okay. And you're not fooling yourself. No. Okay. So that's really good, isn't it? It's a matter of developing that desire to work through it. Now, now that's when you're in a course like this. Now... How many of you have done the same homework without getting asked to do it? So not so many, hey? Yep. And then how many of you have followed through on that particular homework emotionally? Uh, so can you see how, you know, if we're really honest with ourselves, you can see how our motivation isn't that high. All right. We need we almost need someone else to motivate us. All right. So this is an issue and and uh, and as I said, God is not going to do it. God's not going to be your cheer squad. He's waiting for your will to be exercised from a pure sincere location in within inside of yourself. Yep. Okay, well let's look at some of the homework. And um, the first question we had was, how do I personally feel about love? Now I'm not going to ask you to tell me how you personally feel about love. You go, oh, I had all these nice... <laughs> and, and there's one of your motivations to, to just please the presenter or whatever. So, so what I want to do really though is go, what did you... As a summary, what did you learn in that process? Right. So if we go to Lani down front here, because I want to, I want to ask you what you learnt about yourself in that process. Um, I've heard you talk about making this before, and I've, you know, and I thought, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. But then not done it. Yep. And actually doing it, it was so revealing. Yep. It was. I had, my list was. Mm, so opposite to God's love. Yeah. And I had no idea that that's how I felt about love. Yeah. And yeah. it was... And then... Um, so what have you been telling yourself before then, Lani? Like, would you, had you been telling yourself, like, that, that, yeah, I do really want love and all those kind of things? Or, have you, or, or what were you telling yourself before? Well, I'll be controlled... I'll lose my will, I'll be afraid, I'll be terrified. It's all my kind of... <sighs> and then I realised it went back and... Uh. Yeah, my question is more about before you had that awareness, obviously there's a reason why a person doesn't analyse it. And what I'm saying, asking you is, what, what do you think the reason was that you didn't go ahead and analyse it before? Yeah, I had this concept that, you know, a new agey kind of thing. Yeah. Total, total illusion, total false. Yeah. Total false beliefs. So the concept was that I was okay, you know, we were all, we were all love anyway, that kind of yeah. new age type concept. Yeah. 
and uh, and so when you start analyzing your feelings you notice a huge contrast between what you thought about love and to what, totally, and what you feel about love yeah. really shocked yeah thought and then i thought well you really have to feel this you do without feeling it it just it's you stay in it yes and so yeah i started to really understand what how you really without feeling it you just don't get anywhere no you don't no you don't and and isn't it interesting how you can maintain this a sort of self-maintained illusion about yourself and remember i gave that illustration uh, where we have our soul-based feelings and then we have our mind and really all our mind is doing is is supporting what the soul wishes to to believe about itself rather than is actually anything to do with any logic and and this is why i notice most people as yet that i've met are not very logical they they do a lot of illogical things once your once your soul and your mind are in harmony that's when you really start being a lot more logical about things and i'd been trying to build a relationship with god like as a pure relationship but having a bedrock of all this yeah it's like you're trying to do this cut that off from that right and then have a relationship with god from that yes yeah. which is what the majority of people yeah, are trying and to it, do and it kept you know it'd be all right for a while and then bang it's all undone again of course yeah. as soon as you hit a situation the old emotions are just going to yeah. pop up drive the behavior yeah and yeah. i didn't even really realize that they were there yeah yeah so. yeah so that's really good the, the key is to be able to see the difference between these two states this is something that i feel requires a lot of personal honesty and a lot of you need to learn that personal honesty to to separate what you think you know about yourself and what is actually going on inside of yourself like you can see there is a difference between the two and many of you have been trying to pray from your mind right because the pra the prayer is the desire right now if the desire says no I, god's an angry cruel god i don't want god that's my desire and then i'm going oh but god's a loving being you know i'm going to have a relationship with god it's going to be wonderful you know like jesus has told me it's going to be wonderful and and you're there trying to to to, to make that up to make it happen then then where does that prayer go is it a real prayer no it's not so where's it go Uh, as high as you <laughs> as high as your thought is that's where it goes no higher than that and that's what we meant when we were saying in the pageant messages that many people pray but it goes no higher than the thought in their mind do you follow that's why we said it because there's no passion and desire involved in it and there's no reality there's no truth in that none whatsoever so it's very good to have those realizations Yep. Anyone else would like to comment if we go um to to Bruce thanks over in the corner. <clears throat> um I actually thought I was I'm a pretty loving guy. Yep. So I wrote a whole list of things and I come at the end. If you just actually, watch that mic Bruce yeah, so I can hear. I come at the end is I actually withhold love to right. protect myself. Yep. So I don't give my love. Yeah. and and you say to protect yourself so yep. what's that about what are you protecting have you given that much thought well obviously my an emotional state that i don't want to face so i don't want to um trigger yep. something that um so you know i guess protecting my um injured self yep and i don't want to expose myself um, how does withholding love from another protect yourself have you given that much thought um again it, it may be just in the mind but it's uh it's a thing that i feel that i don't um if i withhold i have control right yeah i feel you need to do a lot of more thought on it bruce to be honest because uh, the reality is that when you withhold love from another person to protect yourself you've got to get, examine a lot more deeply what it is that you're trying to protect right and and a lot of it's about exposure like being exposed and then and then somebody then trying to threaten the exposed part of you 
in other words, trying to harm you through yeah, that exposure. Abuse you or abuse you. Or Use exposure. you or abuse you yeah. emotionally, yeah. sexually or physically or otherwise, or even uh, like financially and otherwise. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and so we need to allow ourselves to go probably even deeper than that. The, the, the key in this process is that many of you have learned to give yourself only short bits of time to examine your feelings. And what I'm suggesting to you is you're going to have to give yourself a lot longer periods of time to examine your feelings, right? Because you, your feelings are quite complex. There's a lot of complicated things that have happening, happened in your childhood and your feelings are very complicated. And, and the only way you're going to work through the maze is by feeling each one of them. And that requires giving yourself time to do so. And that's where you're, you're frequently giving your time elsewhere and therefore not taking the time for yourself to feel things. And so you're not going to be able to deeply answer some of these questions until the time is taken. Yeah, yeah look, and that I have struggled you know, in the last couple of days just with giving myself, allowing that I've got the time Yes. Um, to actually sit still and do it. And yes. To, and, yeah, I've actually, my mind's been... Racing away. Racing away. Mm. Yeah. How many of you have a problem with giving yourself time? You want to be busy all the time, doing things all the time. Yeah, it's a, it's a big problem, right? It's a, it's a major problem. It's not creating a soul space to actually feel the true emotional position, right? So, so, so one of the things that you can do using your will is to change your life to a degree so that you're not busy doing things all the time. So you have medita what I'd classify as meditation time, but not in the concept of uh, a new age concept. Just like what I do uh, oftentimes is I'll lay, I'll lay on my bed and just f pray and feel my feelings. And I'll often do that from anywhere from two to four hours straight. Do you follow? We just lay there, just trying to feel what's in my body, what my pains are, all of those kind of things. And, and I, found, I find that if I do that every day, I easily find my true state at, uh, in that process. But if I am busy every day, and we've had periods of time where we've been very, very busy, then it's very, very difficult to do that. Another thing that helps me is by reading material constantly, even if it's the same material over and over again, reading material constantly that helps me do that. Right? So that's why the Robert James Lee's books are so good, because they do help you get into that state and maintain that state. That's why reading the pageant messages are good, same, same reason. They help you get in the state and maintain that state of connection. And that's why it's good to do those particular things. Yep, so if we go to Neil, thanks. Um, for the, I found that, that um, exercise, as I was going through it, it just felt like intellectual. Yep. And because for 30 odd years or more, yep. I thought God is energy. Yep. And I've actually not thought about God, you know, the, the nature of God. and. Only when I met you. You just watch that mic. Oh, sorry. Only, only when I met you. Yeah. You know, did I think of the possibility that God was an entity and so God had personality and so forth. Energy. Yeah. And I thought it was all handled. Yeah. So you know, I meditated every day and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. So um, how do you know? How do I flip into God as an entity? I mean, I you know, I can say it intellectually, but yeah. But uh, you know, how do I feel? It's a very good question, Neil. It's a it's a big issue for most people who are who have new age backgrounds, because uh, most of the time they've been encouraged to see, sort of almost like see God as a power source, like electricity. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 you know while God has power, obviously that's one of God's qualities, but uh, but God's not a power source like electricity. God has a personality. God has feelings and emotions and. God uh, changes those feelings and emotions under certain circumstances too. You know, so so God has differing feeling and emotions that ebb and flow because you can feel that when you, when you when you start connecting to God. Mm. So so God's not human in that regard, but but God has these emotions. Now, the question is a good question, and what I would what I would ask you to do is 
do you think of your wife as a, as a, as electricity? Right? Sometimes. <laughs> and I get burnt. <laughs> you get burnt then. <laughs> you get shocked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I'm pretty sure she wouldn't like to be thought of such. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd make you know that, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, the real issue is that, is that when it comes to human reaction, and this is one reason why we become addicted to human reaction and avoid the reaction with God, is with human reaction we see a face and we, we know, you know, there's, per, there's ears, we can see the body of the person, we can... We can hear what they're saying to us and, and also know when they're hearing us or not mm -hmm. most of the time most of the time because mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. a lot of times we're talking and nobody's listening but mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. um, but but we see that person as a personality don't they, they have a certain nature a mm -hmm. certain personality mm -hmm. and um, and this is so so we don't see the person as energy even though they are energy like mm -hmm. they're, they're just little atomic particles buzzing around like that's all they, all their body is, little atomic particles buzzing around. The reality is, is you, you can see straight through the body, so it's just energy, right? It's just energy buzzing around. But we don't think of them as such, do we? We we think of them as a personality, a nature, a, a free will being, a be a being that has the ability to make choices and decisions, and then change those choices and decisions if they wish. All right. So what I'm suggesting to you is that you need to start seeing God in a similar way, not, not, as, imperfectly, not, not as imperfectly as we see others around us, but, but rather in a similar way that God has nature, personality, and that God, while God has energy, it doesn't mean that God is energy alone. Right? God has love, but love is not God. Right? God is love, but love is an attribute of God. Right. God is wisdom, but, but, but wisdom is not God. Wisdom is an attribute of God, one of the many attributes of God. So you could say your wife is energy, but energy is just an attribute of your wife. It's a part of her nature or personality, right? And how she uses that energy is very much influenced by her nature and personality, is it not? Mm. Like she'll go and do some things that you might not do. Mm. And, there, and, and therefore demonstrate that she's using her will to guide and direct the energy that she has. Right? And the key is to begin contemplating that God is identical to that, but without the human impediment of sin. Right? And then also is perfectly uh, expressed in an infinitely powerful way rather than a limited with limited power. So that, that's, that's how you begin to, if, if, if you can allow yourself to even intellectually contemplate that God is like that, mm. then that means that God wants to know you and God wants to hear from you mm. and God would like you to hear from God if that's what you want. Mm. And, and therefore you can begin a dialogue mm. with God that might first begin intellect as an intellectual process but over time you'll start feeling replies which which will then start mean meaning that you start feeling god and therefore knowing for certain that the interaction is actually occurring does that make sense yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's a very good question and and it's interesting we can listen to the divine love path for years can't we mm. without even contemplating some very basic things about what we what, what we conceive and, and there are many people still, I feel, who have heard divine truth for many years, who still really have not even begun to conceive uh, as, uh, of God as a, person, a personality mm -hmm. with power and attributes that are all loving. Mm -hmm. The majority of people haven't even begun to conceive that yet. Mm -hmm. right? Because if they had have, they would have started this process a lot earlier. <laughs> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. If we go to Uvira, straight behind. Um, <coughs> what are the emotions that ebb and flow for God and what triggers them? Well, there were a period of time when there was no one on earth who had experienced any of God's love. 
And so none of God's love flowed into any person on earth or in the spirit world. And that went on for nearly, on this planet, went on for nearly 150,000 years. So that's an example. <laughs> so because nobody was want, oh, no, I nobody know, wanted, nobody wanted it. Didn't understand that. Nobody wanted it. Yeah. So he couldn't send that love. No. To earth. No. But then God would have still been. Like, doesn't God always send love? It just depends on whether you're willing to receive. Yeah, but it. it's not being received, so it's not flowing. It's stuck, isn't it? Like. Don't you think? Does God feel sad about that or does God not feel sad? Well, no, God doesn't feel sad. And actually, once you work through all of your sadness, you won't feel sad either. <laughs> right? And I know that might be hard to conceive, but, but it, it can only be tried, can't it, and worked through, and then you'll find out the truth of that. Yeah. So what have you been feeling? That's Like you said, once you get to a certain point, you can feel the ebb and flow. Of different feelings, yeah, from God, right? Different different sensations and feelings from God can be can can have ebb and flow based on the use of God's will. God God is like God has will. God has power, control. God has will. God doesn't. So so God desires things and does things. God creates things. Like all of God's creative power ebbs and flows based on what God wants to create at the time. Like, why was it that the, that the process of the incarnation process didn't occur for many million, billions of years, actually, in the universe? Why, why is that? Because, because God knew, oh, what we've got to do first is create a structure. Uh, firstly, the laws. So God created all the laws first, and then God created the physical structures, which were all based upon how the laws work. And, then, and so this is the different flows of different kinds of creative energy from God. So, so of course, God, God's energy changes and flows depending on what God wants to do. God's not limited in the way it flows, whereas we are. So in other words, if God wants to create, God creates. It's not, it's not like with us, if you wanted to create a great big uh, auditorium and you wanted to do it all with your own you know, power rather than actually doing it with a bulldozer and other <laughs> equipment, then... Um, then it might take you many millennia to get to the state where you can do that, right? But with God, God can, is already in that state, so God can do that instantly, if God wanted to. And there's times when God wants to. So God does. I, I was going to sound a bit stupid, but it sort of feels like if, if you're a being that exists for that long, you have to sort of find ways to not be bored. <laughs> <laughs> Well, many of you have that viewpoint with 70 years that you're often bored. Um, I've had 2,000 years and I've never been bored. And I know people, I've met people who've had 150,000 years and I've never been bored. So... Because they're always in a, like a joyous, creative state, is that...? Yeah, they're always thinking of new things to do, always growing. If, particularly after the 2000, you know, when after my appearance on Earth, they started to grow again. There were, there were times in between, before then that they felt concerned, but not since then. That's one of my fears. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's one of your fears. It's one of the feelings you have about the universe, you know, the reality of the universe. The, real, the reality is that, that God's created an infinite playground and, and at this stage very, none of you have a concept of infinity, of course. So, so you don't know what are the possibilities as a result and you're too afraid to even begin trying to find out. That's part of the problem. If you just examine what you could investigate here on Earth for a moment. Like there's people who are like an oceanographer or something like that, who's just studying the floor of the ocean. That's all they're studying, nothing else. Right? They've done it for their entire life and they're still totally enthusiastic about it because they're still finding out new things. And they've done it for 70 years straight. Right? One thing. 
and they've done it for 70 years straight and they're still enthusiastic about the discoveries that they find and they know there's more to discover and that's what drives them and they're now old men, old women and, and you know, wish they had another 70 years to do it. Right? And then when that person passes, what I've observed is they often stay on the earth still doing it because now they can see more that's going on than they could see before. <laughs> Does that make sense? They can see a whole lot of other particles they couldn't see before and all these kind of things. So that then changes their theories of what, what was actually going on. So they spend all this time investigating the thing for years and years after that. Right? And that's just one pursuit. Right, let's say you're a musician. Right. Do you think you, you see all these rock stars who began in the you know 60s or whatever? A lot of them are still singing to audiences today. Why do you think that they're doing that? Because they, they love it, right? They love it. They love it. And yet, and yet we say, oh, it, it would be boring. And and I'm saying, no. There, there's a person just doing one thing, and they're not bored. Uh, imagine now if you could do every possible area of pursuit on this planet. How long would that take you? So we're now talking study of the physical body, the animals, you know, creatures, life, the earth itself, the science behind the whole thing. How many thousands of years do you think that would take you? And, and let's say now you're a spirit and you're still focused on the earth. You haven't even started on the spirit world and there's even more things there. So how are you going to get bored? You're not going to get bored. You're going to probably feel a bit overwhelmed about how much there is to do and, 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 you, and you'll be glad that you've got a lot of time to do it. <laughs> right? That's how you feel. Yeah. And that's the universe God created. And, and that tells us something about God's personality. God's put infinity into our hearts. And what I mean by that is that God's put the desire for us to endlessly discover in our hearts. That is part of the original gift of our will that God gave us right at the beginning. And, and when you connect to that, you will be fascinated by so many different things that you won't know what to do in the day because there's too many things you want to get done <laughs> rather than not enough. You follow? And every one of them you find fascinating. You won't be bored. But you might be challenged. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, um, it is time for us to uh, probably have a break in a minute, so I, I just wanted to say a few things before we do. I want to encourage you to continue this process of trying to delve down into what you really feel inside of your heart. What do you feel? about these particular things right? and in particular focus on what you're going to do to develop some kind of connection with God connection with the source so that you can be educated right? because without that connection education is not going to be possible no one and it doesn't matter even if it's a celestial spirit they're not going to be able to educate you completely on everything are they because they're still learning right? The only person who can educate you completely on everything is God. So, so it makes sense to develop this relationship with God in your infancy. And all of you are in your infancy. You understand what I mean by that? You're in your infancy. You're like a, a, a five-year-old or less child still learning about some very basic things when it comes to education in love in particular. So, so, so allow yourself to feel that you're in your infancy. And what would you do if you were back? If you remember back as a child, what would you do if you really wanted to know something here? What would you do? Surely you would develop it, wouldn't you? Yeah. And you'd put some time into developing it, and you'd be fascinated by it, and you'd feel some joy about it as well. Right? What I notice many of you do is that you're not feeling much joy, right? And, that, uh, and there must be reasons for that, mustn't there? Because a, because a child is learning all these things and taking a lot of risks, right? You, you, we, we gave the illustration a few days ago of the child learning to walk. It's taking a lot of risks. 
And it's not going, it's not going oh, I don't think I can walk because, uh, you know, I might fall over, is it? But as adults, many of you are doing that with your relationship with God in particular, but also with your, just your day-to-day -day life. You're going, I can't go and do that because it might fail. I can't do that because it might fail. I go, if I go and do that, my partner won't like me anymore and I can't leave my her so, or him, so that, that, that won't work. So that will fail and I don't want that to fail. So, so we have all of these things going on, don't we? Which are all fears dictating what we do. Now, if we got back that childlike attitude, the childlike attitude which says, I'm going to investigate this stuff. I'm going to do, put some effort into it. I'm going to do it every day because I like it. Because I want to try, try it out. I, I want to see, see what happens and see what, see what changes in my life as a result of it. If I had that kind of passion, then it's highly unlikely hardly any of you would be here today probably. Because you'd be too busy out doing something else. <laughs> that you have a passion and you're already connecting to God. You're already getting educated by God. And you, you're engaging your passion. You might, one of your passions might be sharing what you've learned. So you might be out doing that. You might be up here giving a talk to a hundred other people. Right? In that place. But it requires you development of your will. And I, I keep on reminding myself that God's not going to force me, God's not going to force me to do anything. Anything. God's not going to pressurize me, threaten me, force me into doing it. It's, it's, it's completely on whether I want to or not. And what I notice is that for many, for many adults on this planet, we've lost the want to for so many things. Haven't we? You know, we have a few hurt relationships. After that, do we have a want for a relationship anymore? No. Nah. We have a few failed financial ventures. After we've had a few failed financial ventures, do we want to try another new financial venture anymore? No. Nah. Nah. We have a few friends and then we have a few arguments with those friends and there's problems with those friends and so we get to the point where we're not really looking for friends anymore. Right? And we do that with so many, in so many areas of our life, don't we? Where, we where, where the previous hurt that we've not allowed ourselves to feel adds up and adds up and adds up into what it feels like inside of us, like a crescendo, you know, like a, a, a high point that, that is impossible for us to contemplate doing it one more time. And that's because we've not processed it. And if you think about how a child learns to walk, a child gets up, starts walking, falls flat on its face, cries its heart out and let go of the pain there and then. So what's the next thing it does? It gets up again and does a walk. Right? Falls flat on its face. Cries its heart out. Right? Gets up and it's like, it's like it never happened. Have you noticed that? That's what the child does. It's like it's never happened when, when the child does that. And this is the thing, is that it gets up, cries its, heart, it cries its heart out before it gets up, right? Doesn't it? Right? Cries its heart out, eventually it calms down. Like it can even break legs and break arms and all sorts of things and still it'll just cry its heart out and get up and then do almost exactly the same thing again with a slight modification, hopefully. <laughs> you know. But it does exa almost exactly the same thing again without any care in the world. And why does it do that? Because it's released the emotion of the damage. Right? And the reason why that's not happening for us right, is because we're not releasing the emotion of the damage. You see? We're not releasing the emotion of the damage. And so when, when we contemplate getting up again, 
and trying another walk. We're going, hang on a sec, the last time I did this. And we tell ourselves the story of the last time we've done it. And the reason why that story exists within us still is because it's an emotional thing we have not released. So it exists within us still. That story is going to be replayed over and over again now while it's inside of us and we've got to learn to release it. That's the only way that we're going to get up, do it again and do it with joy. Right? Do it without any fear, do it without any concern for our safety, welfare or whatever. We're just going to engage our will over and over again. And when we don't, when we do all of these different things and they all add up and they get to the point where we just don't do anything anymore, that's an indication we've not let go of those things. That's proof that we've used our will to suppress. It's proof that we're not using our will to love. All right. Okay. Well, what we'll do now is we'll have a, a, a brief uh, break. It'll be only about five minutes this break, if that's okay with you guys. And then we'll get started on our program today.